doesn't understand what movements and social change and political and economic change are about. I stand here today, as Marnie said too, that the spirit of occupied Wall Street is still alive. It's in here and it's up here. And we, the advocates, the people who believe in freedom, justice, and equality, we're not going to be quiet. We're going to continue to talk, especially in the Trump era. Since November of 2016, I wear resist. What does that mean? That means we challenge, we object, and where necessary, we resist government policies and practices that are inconsistent what American principles and values are supposed to be about. Read the Declaration of Independence. Read the Constitution. That sets forth the roadmap for how we take on people who abuse our rights. We need to look at the midterm elections. We need to then look at our Constitution and find in the roadmap what you do when you have autocratic government, when you have people in government who are not doing what the Constitution requires and what we the people need and want. Don't give up. Don't give up. I learned when I went south in the 60s in the Southern Civil Rights Movement, I say Southern because America still hasn't had its civil rights movement. It's good to be smart. The most important ingredient is stamina. You got to outlast the opponents. And so, as Dr. King always said, come together in the beloved community and we shall, yes, we shall, we shall overcome someday. Thank you. Occupy. The spirit lives on. Thank you all. I feel like shouting, mic check. Woo! Mic check. But I don't want to do the whole speech like that because I, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm Howie Hawkins. I'm the Green Party candidate for governor of New York. But I'm here because I'm a veteran occupier. And as I reflect on this anniversary, there are two things come to mind. One is, you never know when you start something that it's going to be the event that changes history. And I can tell you this is somebody who started in a lot of movements that were a small minority. In 66 and 67, those of us opposed to the war in Vietnam were a small minority. And we were a majority a few years later. The anti-nuclear power movement, the anti-apartheid divestment sanctions movement, right on down to getting the ban on fracking after the campaigns in 2014. And what happened with Occupy, I was part of a group, Margaret Flowers, Kevin Zeese in Washington, D.C. We're looking at the Arab Spring and the occupations of Tahrir Squares, Freedom Squares, and that Egyptian occupation inspired us. So in April of 2011, we said, come to Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. on October 6th, which was the anniversary of this never ending war that got started in Afghanistan and the beginning of Obama's austerity budget that year. And then a few months later, Adbuster said, come to Wall Street on a couple weeks earlier than October 6th. And we saw that, great, we're going to Freedom Plaza. Well, by the time we got to Freedom Plaza, we were now part of Occupy that started here. And that's what I mean. You agitate, you talk to people, and then at some point, it's the right time, the right place, and the people come. Now remember why this took off. The police pinned those young women and maced them gratuitously. And people all over the country were outraged. And now it expressed not just bad police, but a bad system on for whom they work. Because the 1% is headquartered here. So first lesson is, don't give up, keep agitating, and we will make progress. The second lesson that Occupy brought to our movements was the class issue. The 1% versus the 99%. It suddenly became legitimate to target this 1% who in this city in 1980 got 12% of all the income. Today they get 
10 years after the crash. And what were we chanting? Banks got bailed out. We got sold, we got sold out. And that's where we are right now. But we have new currents coming forward. Marty asked me to say the impact on the Greens. Greens, a lot of us come out of peace and environmental movements, and the, the class question was kind of difficult. Not after Occupy, it legitimized it, and the Greens are clear on that now. So what has also come forward? We got people that aren't really socialists calling themselves socialists. We got a majority of Democrats, according to public opinion polls, saying, oh, socialism may be a good idea. A majority of millennials. And we had a saying in the 1960s, the issue is not the issue, the issue is the system. Because under capitalism, wealth concentrates. And that translates into concentrated political power. So we got a two-party system, which is slicker than the old Soviet one-party state. It's a two-party state with two government parties that preside over the concentration of wealth into the hands of the 1%. And we think we got a choice. That's why it's slicker. It's like Boss Tweed used to say, you can vote for anybody you want as long as I get to pick the candidates. So the primaries are pre-chosen by the money primary. And those that get the money then get into the primary. And then you get a choice. The rich are behind a few candidates, and you get to pick among the ones they chose. And then you go to the general election. So before the game even gets started, they've already pre-chosen your options. But people are getting wise to this game. And they're talking about system change. And until we have economic democracy based on social ownership of the major means of production, whether it's worker co-ops in the private sector or public enterprises like NYCHA, MTA, NYPA, the New York Power Authority, are democratized so they answer to the constituents like the tenants in housing and the workers in those uh, enterprises so that in the worker co-ops we get the full fruit of our labor. It doesn't go to absentee owners as profits, but the full value we get our share according to the labor contributed and in the public sector it's supposed to operate at public benefit at cost rather than for private profit but if it's not democratic they use these public enterprises to subsidize the one percent so this is now on the agenda and occupy has enabled it to get on the agenda so remember the issue is not the issue the issue is the system and we need system change thank you Hi, thank you, Marnie. Yeah. Okay, so I am very proud. This, my name is Sansara Taylor. I am a supporter of the Revolutionary Communist Party and a follower of Baba Baking and the New Communism. And I'm also proud to say I was part of Occupy. I spent a lot of time down here seven years ago and in the days and weeks that followed. And I also want to say that the impetus that led to Occupy, the howling and profound inequalities in this world, not just in this country, but on a global scale, have not only pers persisted, but grown worse. Today we live in a world where the 42 richest people on the planet control more wealth than half of humanity. 3.7 billion people. We live in a world where 82% of the global wealth is controlled by 1% of the population on a world scale. So I am here to say, not only was Occupy righteous in standing up and calling this out, but the outrages that Occupy fought against continue and continue to need to be fought and defeated. And in this light, I think as we are upholding the spirit of Occupy, we also need to uphold the debate and the spirit of wrangling that opened up. And I want to bring out something that I brought into this occupation seven years ago with others. And I want to read an excerpt from it. This is a very prescient and insightful statement. I'm going to read just a part of it from the revolutionary leader, Bob Abakian, who is commenting on Occupy. And he upheld the profound, positive role of this movement, but he also said, and I think these words ring even more true today when you look back on it. He said, the idea or ideal, which at this point has considerable currency among many involved in or supportive of these protests, that a horizontal, as opposed to a hierarchical movement, can in and of itself serve as a means of major social change, and perhaps even a model of a different society. 
This idea or ideal does not and cannot measure up to the reality of what is actually required to fundamentally uproot and transform society, and indeed the world, marked by profound inequalities and relations of exploitation and oppression within every single country and in the world as a whole, divided between imperialist powers and the vast third world, dominated by these imperialist powers. To uproot and transform all this requires nothing less than an unprecedented revolution, a radical overturning of the entrenched and violently repressive ruling forces and imperial powers who now dominate human social existence and the deep-seated economic, social, and political relations of exploitation and oppression of which they are the embodiment and the enforcers. And to achieve this radical revolution, we need science and we need a scientific approach to making revolution. And so today, as the inequalities, the injustices, the global exploitation that Occupy called out rages, even more intensely than years ago, and at a time when in this country, the top dog in the imperialist food chain, we now have a fascist regime in power, a white, openly white supremacist, Trump, Pence, fascist regime, an openly misogynist and hatefully Christian fascist bigoted regime, a regime that is threatening the world with nuclear weapons and environmental catastrophe. It is more important than other, ever before that people come back in the streets, stand up and rely on ourselves to resist, not the mechanisms of power, That's the right. official channels in this country, but the power of the people in the streets, and that more than ever we get into what it will really take to end this. So I want to challenge and invite all of you up this Sunday to Revolution Books. We are premiering and previewing a new film, a speech by Bob Avakey, and getting into why we need an actual revolution, why this system cannot be reformed, why you cannot get a few reforms, a few laws passed, or a new face in power. You need to overturn the whole system. You need to radically yeah. make a full That's revolution. Right. Yeah. Right. And in this speech, Bob Avakian cha tackles the most challenging question that has vexed revolutionaries and freedom fighters in this country for generations and around the world, which is how a revolution could actually be made in a country as powerful as this one. This is what cries out to be done. This is what humanity needs from us at this dark hour, and this is possible. Come up to Revolution Books this Sunday, 4 o'clock, 132nd, and Malcolm X Boulevard in Harlem. Get back in the streets. Raise your voices. Do not stop. In the name of humanity, we must defy those in power. We must resurrect the spirit of Occupy and go much further and actually win. Thank you, sisters and brothers. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Fithian, and I was here the day we took Liberty Plaza on September 17th, seven years ago, and it was a beautiful thing. One of the things that Occupy taught us was never doubt that marginalized people can change the world. We've seen it with the First Nations rising up to change the, save the planet, Standing Rock. We've seen the Black Lives Matter movement emerging to help us all reclaim our humanity. When Trump put kids in cages, the Latino community rose up, and with allies, all of a sudden, ICE across the countries were being occupied. The movement here inspired new generations, captured the imagination, changed the national debate, and opened a space for where Another world is not only possible, it was now. On this very ground that we stand on today, we built a community that knew how to love one another, that fed one another, took care of our health needs, made sure we had books to read, took care of our children, everything you needed, cleaned the park, made sure we had the, Senate, the clean facilities we needed to be healthy and whole. When we live in this culture of power over that is breeding death and destruction, destroying our humanity, taking our livelihood every day, without these models and moments and movements of life and inspiration, we would have little hope left. But Occupy changed that, as has every other movement that has been willing to throw down. And the one thing I want to say about Occupy 
that was also important and essential to remember. We were not afraid to take direct action. We were not afraid to take and hold space. We were not afraid to say, shut it down. Whether it's Wall Street, corporate lawyers, banks, the police. There's no room in our world for that violence against our humanity. And it means we have to stand up and fight back. We have a long way to go in this country. We walk in the legacy and the footsteps of many, many movements before us. And our ancestors are with us. And we can see what has been growing. More and more people are waking up. You know, the radicals, we got to get more back in the game. The liberals are rising up, bless their hearts, as they say in the South. But everybody in this next period, like I'll just say right now, I'm going down to D.C. on Thursday because the Kavanaugh confirmation has got to be shut the fuck down. I mean, this is serious stuff. We can't just, there's no one way. There's, you know, there's many places we have to fight, from the streets to the halls of power. We have to stop throwing each other under the bus. There's not enough of us, we don't have the resources, but together, our imagination, our hearts, our creativity, the gifts we all bring, change the world. And we're doing it every day. I'm just so lucky to feel like I got to be in New York on this anniversary. I didn't even sort of realize it until this morning, and I was like, I've got to be there. I'm actually leaving the city as soon as I'm done here. But I want to say that, you know, wherever we are, in this country, whatever community we are in, there are kindred spirits that are fighting back. And this is a global movement. And I just, uh, the solidarity we've had with one another, the victories for working class people, for those homeowners that lost their home, for the Latinos who've been, you know, encaged, for the Muslims who've been trying to be banned, from the black folks who face police violence every day, from the indigenous people who continue to face genocide. Right, this is all real, and those of us with white skin privilege, we have to continue to do what we can to keep our skin in the game, because our liberation is bound to everyone else's. We are as sick from white supremacy as we ourselves enacted every day. <clears throat> Everybody, get out of your homes, get into the streets, rise up, fight back, occupy, shut shit down, and we are going to make a better world every day. Thank you. So I just want to say, <laughs> landlords and developers are very afraid of Jessica and her dog, Angelina Jolie. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> they are. I think the mic's still like, oh, stop working. Oh, it stopped working? No, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we can just well, I can shout. Okay. Um, forgive me, everybody. I'm a little unsteady on my feet, but I know exactly how to make landlords run and hide. What this previous lady said was correct. We need to shut shit down. That should be the motto, the, that should be the t-shirt. You may have read about me, it was all over the newspaper, my landlord, Lloyd Goldman, formerly Goldman Goldman Di Lorenzo. Di Lorenzo went to jail for racketeering years ago. He was forced to pay me and my elderly mom a half a million dollars for the years of harassment to get out of our rent-controlled apartment. We had been to court 48 times in my lifetime on false charges. As Marnie knows, everything is corrupt in the system. The corruption starts from the clerk in the housing court who won't let you file a petition. It extends to the lawyers, to the judges, Everybody gets paid off, including the cops. That is why we need to mass together, rise up, and shut shit down. Now, I would not allow my landlord to do it any further, so I spent two years getting petitions. I filed numerous court actions. Filing a court action, which is free, and you don't need to pay a fee, and you don't need to pay an expensive lawyer, is a way to gain back your power. Everyone needs to rise up together and do a class action and target specific landlords as I did. BLDG management is on their way out. I have a Facebook page entitled, Why is my landlord not in jail? I want everybody to spread that word and if they have 
photos of their landlords and they have specific stories, I want you to send them to me. Because I personally will go to court on behalf of anyone who wants to file an action and doesn't know how. Lastly, Angelina Jolie has been abused, threatened to be killed, beaten by my landlord. And those of you may not know this, in New York City, you can kill a dog, you can torture and beat an animal, and the police will not arrest the person because an animal is considered property. It isn't the life. So, what we need to do, and what the Green Party candidate was the first to join on, is change the law to make it criminal to kill or abuse an animal. There isn't one politician who represents me in Greenwich Village, not one that's responded to my request for help. So, I want you to spread the word, and again, if you need help, remember, why is my landlord not in jail? That should be the motto for the next 10 years. Never mind bullshit, arguing, and this and that, and help self-representation. We need to target and make and hold these landlord billionaires responsible. Donald Trump isn't the only landlord we've got to watch out for. New York is filled with landlords. Only one went to jail, Stephen Crowman. He only spent three months there. He got out and he's at it again. Okay? Thanks for your support. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Oh, my God. Come on. Hi. Am I loud enough? Yeah, that's good. My name is Dana Beal, and I'm a yippee, which is an earlier protest movement. As a matter of fact, I hitchhiked when I was 16 to the Martin Luther King March on Washington. And I want to tell you that the movement of the 60s supported the same issues. Martin Luther King had a poor people's march the year they shot him, the year they killed Robert Kennedy, the year the yippies went to Chicago and the cops beat the crap out of us. Now, I came along when Abby Hoffman got busted for cocaine. And I led the yippies for about 10 years until Abby came back, we brought him back, and got him out of trouble. And during the period of time, I was doing it, we did something that everybody considered to be trivial. We tried to legalize pot. But you know something about pot? Pot undermines big pharma. Pot means that you can grow some plants in your yard and treat AIDS wasting, migraine, and all kinds of things. You don't have to buy a pill. It's the great equalizer. Everybody can make a little bit of money from pot. That's why it's illegal. Still, Jeff Sessions is still trying to make it illegal. <coughs> As a matter of fact, when Occupy Wall Street occurred and Aaron Kay represented us as the NPCs, as you can see, it's a little harder for him to stand up. I was in prison for med medical marijuana. Actually, I was in a county jail in Wisconsin for bringing marijuana to AIDS patients in New York City. That was my crime. And they treated it as a very serious crime. They said, we're going to give you eight years for that. And I told the judge, I don't know what you're doing. I'm 64. Everybody in my family dies of a stroke when they're 65. Isn't giving me eight years a little bit long? Well, a week later, I had a massive heart attack and died on the jailhouse floor, and I was dead for three minutes. And I ended up having to go to the hospital. The Jail gave me bail because they didn't have, want to have to pay for the operation. They were such cheapskates. And I got out 
And guess what I discovered? Because I've been following Occupy Wall Street on television. They had Occupy Wall Street in Madison, Wisconsin. They had Occupy Wall Street everywhere. Occupy Wall Street. Okay, Donald Trump is a reaction to Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is a reaction to all Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street is a reaction to the Tea Party. The Tea Party is a reaction to our first black president. Now, we have Nazis marching in the streets. My dad didn't spend World War II in Italy so that we could have Nazis marching in the streets, okay? There's something really fucking rotten in Denmark, okay? Or maybe in Trump Tower. And we have to fucking get rid of these people. You know, these are fucking outright fascists. They are exploiting the division between the 1% and the 99% for really dark purposes. It doesn't have to go good and become a socialist paradise. You could end up in Berlin in 1945 having people dropping bombs on you. So get it together, folks. I just have one more thing I gotta say, okay? We didn't do that whole time without coming up with something really earth-shaking, and it wasn't marijuana, which everybody else had. The Yippies invented the cure for drugs. Ibogaine. They just had it on WBUR. Somebody went down to Mexico, took it. They asked him in the morning, you got your heroin withdrawal? No withdrawal at all. This is a single dose drug that obsoletes a large amount of big pharma. It obsoletes Suboxone and Naloxone and Vivitrol. The stuff they're trying to give everybody who's addicted, so they'll be 16 times more addicted because methadone is four times more addictive than heroin. Guess what? Naloxone is four times more addictive than methadone. They want you to be on a drug for the rest of your life. I'm, I'm on heart pills. I'm going to be on drugs for the rest of my life because of my heart attack. They want to fucking exploit every single little tiny extrusion of your personality if they can so we have to fucking clear up the idea that me and Aaron are a bunch of boneheads Cheech and Chong cartoons that never had an idea in your life we have to you know what we have to do we have to bring back unions in this country we have to bring back unions. That'll be revolutionary. Aaron. I mean, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Aaron K., the Yippie Pie Thrower. Woo! I was here seven years ago, and one of my first things I did here was to run the neo Nazi LaRussians out of here. I go up to them and just let them have it. They knew that I was ready to bring a lynch mob after the LaRussians. So they went bye-bye. Now we're dealing with a real problem. You deal with these clowns who've been doing Unite the Right in D.C. and Charlottesville and Jason Kessler. I've been going on Twitter publishing their home phone numbers and addresses telling people these Nazis love getting calls at 4 a.m. And there was a mention in the New York Times about a Holocaust denier named Arthur Jones, where he was getting nasty calls during his New York Times interview. So what? He preaches us a philosophy of hate. My parents survived the camps, so I feel people's justice has to be needed out to them. Thank you, Mark. Yes, 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 Occupy. Um, with, on the spirit of Occupy, I, I have a lot of songs at home, of course, made out of, um, on this cardboard, I 
never slept on the park, but I walked from the first week. I was always here, and I I used to support the people here at the park. So I just wanted to tell you, I have a lot of signs, and I brought three signs today. And this sign, I actually made it right before um, the Blasio became mayor. The Blasio um, was talking about uh, the tale of two cities. And right now, he made sure that the city is really a tale of two cities. Yeah, that's right. Okay? Right. Take a look at the housing. How he's, uh, he has this rezoning, especially in black and brown community. And how he's taking those lands and giving it to these investors to push people of color out of the city. And he talks about the tale of two cities. Yes, yes, I agree with him that he really made it the tale of two cities. WBAI, take it away, Ken. Mike check. Mike check. Mike check. Mike check. Do you miss saying Mike check? Mike check. Mike check. Do you miss Mike that? Check. Happy Occupy Wall Street anniversary, everybody. Yay. Something else you might remember. What do they want? Remember that mainstream media go, what do they want? They couldn't get their heads around why we were here, right? They're into specializing. But I'll give them an excuse, okay? When we're in school, we have math class, we have science class, we have history class, we have English class. You don't talk about science, math in science class. You don't talk about history in English class, right? We specialize. We can't think of two things at the same time. Occupy Wall Street put it all together. We put together finance. We put together health problems. We put together housing, environment, labor, econ labor, economics, and racism. It was all related. If you help improve one of those things for the 99%, you're improving all of them. Right? An example of people have been talking about housing. The rents are too damn high. They are keeping New York City from recovering from Sandy. They're keeping us from having good energy in our buildings. Right? 90% of our buildings, the energy is wasted. You buy it and it goes through the windows and the doors. The people who would make the buildings better are working class people. They can't afford to live here. So there's nobody to do the work of making our buildings more efficient and more comfortable to live in. Who puts up solar panels? Working class people. They can't afford to live here. All the people who came up here after Hurricane Sandy because they had skills and experience to help recover from hurricanes. They couldn't afford to live here. So they went to New Jersey, they went to Long Island. Guess what? People in New Jersey hired them. People on my own hired them. They recovered from Hurricane Sandy a hell of a lot faster than New York City did. But I just wanted to give you an overview that all these different issues that we can call separate issues are interconnected really tightly. And Occupy Wall Street has made a lot more people realize that than ever did before. So hooray for Occupy Wall Street! All day, all week, Occupy Wall Street. All day, all week, Occupy Wall Street. All day, all week, Occupy Wall Street. It's all up to you guys. Keep it going. Scott Andrew Hutchins, and this is my 6S17 in Zuccotti Park. When Occupy Wall Street began, I was in housing court and so destitute from a long period of unemployment that I was unable to even purchase a Metro card, watching Tim Pool's live cast while I still had internet access. I worked with Occupy Jacksonville when I had a job there protesting Wells Fargo on May Day 2012, shortly after which I lost my job and returned to New York, where I've been living in the shelter system ever since. Some inquiries brought me to some of the surviving Occupy groups, the encampment having been broken up, but I visited an Occupy education group in Union Square and almost immediately joined OccuRevolve, now Occupy on an Equal World, which led me to Alternative Banking Group, now Occupy the Future. 
I visited the People's Puppet several times before becoming involved with Picture of the Homeless, which trained to Occupy Wall Street and which met at the same time. I participated in numerous campaigns with this organization, including working on the board game Trust Bill, the business of homelessness white paper, showing how service workers in the shelter system rip off shelter clients, front-end workers, and public funds to enrich themselves, as well as testifying before city council and meeting with members of the council and staff of assembly members in Albany. The housing situation in New York is out of hand. As Mara Gay pointed out in the Wall Street Journal, thousands of working New Yorkers are homeless because they can't afford so-called affordable housing, which requires at least $40,000 a year, something I've never made with my master's degree, and often six figures to actually afford. And de Blasio was recently recorded in a town hall in Canarsie saying that he thinks 10% of this set aside specifically for the homeless is excessive despite increases in the shelter population during his term. Gwyn Guilford in Quartz also notes how misleading official unemployment numbers are. They assume that people have stopped looking for work after their benefits are exhausted, which is probably not true of most and certainly not for me. I represent Picture the Homeless as part of the Public Bank NYC coalition spearheaded by the New, the New Economy Project. The primary focus is on wholesale banking so that private banks can't make a profit off public taxes and fees and invest in things that we oppose, such as oil pipelines and private prisons. We are currently working with Mark Levine's office to ensure his proposed study bill does not have the flaws of other city studies. Namely, that those doing the study had a vested interest in the status quo and opposed the creation of a public bank. Finally, I am on my third run for political office with the Green Party, running for U.S. House of Representatives against Carol Maloney in District 12, having previously run for State Assembly and City Council with a platform that includes public banking, implementation of a nationwide version of Utah's Housing First program, ending the drug war in private prisons, abolishing ICE, and criminalizing the sponsoring or co-sponsoring of unconstitutional bills such as Schumer's anti-BDS bill, which my opponent co-sponsored. These are some of the ways that Occupy Wall Street has activated me politically from an apolitical independent in Indianapolis who typically voted Republican because their candidates were consistently popular there and didn't seem particularly repellent when I came of age in the 1990s. Thank you. So, hi everybody. My name is Harrison Schultz, Dr. Harrison Schultz, actually. And uh, I'm one of the original architects of this movement. I was around when there was fewer people than this. I watched this grow into something far beyond any of our expectations. And we've done it again time and time since then. After Occupy Wall Street, I helped out with an initiative called Occupy Weed Street, which never got its full due credit for the legal medical cannabis bill that we have in the state right now. We'll be working on more initiatives to push recreational cannabis and psychedelics within the coming year. And um, uh, yeah, we've done this before. We've been here before. And we're not here to celebrate those old accomplishments, though. We're here to achieve new heights. You got your, your, your payment already. All right. Your payment. Here's what happened. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. All right. Occupy Wall Street created the Rolling Jubilee. Yes. The Rolling Jubilee went out to start a charity to raise $50,000 to abolish a million dollars worth of medical debt. That was in 2012. They ended up raising over $700,000. They abolished between 30 and $40 million worth of debt. Medical debt, student debt, payday loan debt, and, and then they decided that they were going to do, go in a different direction. When they did, when they did, my partner and I, Craig Antico, who had been working with Occupy to help abolish that debt, we just started to start RIP medical debt, rest in peace medical debt, and so far. We have, thanks to donors, thanks to the people that support the cause that you're talking about, which is making it, taking debt, medical debt, off the backs of our fellow Americans. We've abolished over $120 million of the medical debt. So you guys, I just want to say one thing. Jerry and Craig 
were on John Oliver's show. You know John Oliver, Late Night Tonight? And you can tell the story better, but John Oliver abolished how much is it? 15 million. 15 million in medical debt. And it was all his organization, which I thought was amazing. So um, this is, they, they implemented something um, from Strike Debt, right? From Strike Debt. Strike Debt. And, um, you know, rolled it over to medical debt, and it's been very, very successful. So this is kind of what I want to say is like, with Occupy Walls, what are, what are the mechanisms that we can use to move forward? And one of them is, is this, you know, so. And tell them that if you also was on Channel 21, on PBS. Yeah, so the deal is, the energy of Occupy Wall Street has only changed and transformed in other forms of protest, other forms of making a difference. As a good example, Marnie Halasa, who is a politician now, thanks to Occupy yes, Wall Street. Yes, yes, yes. City Council, I'm going to run in three years again. We're going to need help. I'm going to the centrist Democrats' is That's what I'm going to do. Yay. <laughs> so, uh, again, when I first showed up here, I was dressed not any different than you guys, but now that I'm a real charity, I get to put a suit on. So nobody has to tell me when they walk by to get a job anymore. I'm very happy about that. So ripmedicaldebt.org, by the end of this year, we will have abolished $1 billion worth of medical debt. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, real fast, my name is Jim. I was part of Vision and Goals, and I was part of something called Think Tank. And I'm here, as I've come every year, just collecting thoughts, collecting ideas, trying to get a sense of what is important to people, particularly what our most fundamental problems are. Because as you can see, there's a lot of diversity here. There are people who are more interested in banking, environment, justice. There's a lot of issues, and I just love to collect thoughts on what people consider to be our most fundamental ideas. So I'll be over there. Love to just sit and chat on that or anything. Thank you. And uh, upwards and onwards, keep calm and carry on. And uh, may the forest be with you. And let the spirit of Occupy live on in everything you do. Here's my curtsy. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll do this again next year.